In November 2022, as world leaders and industry experts gather at the 27th annual session of the UN Climate Change Conference known as COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, WSP experts will be on site to work alongside delegates as they seek to accelerate climate action. This follows on from COP26 and the Paris Agreement of 2015, which aligns signatories to curb temperature rises globally to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Even with this increase, this will result in more than 4 billion people being impacted by frequent climate shocks. But what progress has been made in the seven years since that historic agreement was reached? And what do we need to see at COP27 if we're going to make real strides towards averting catastrophic climate change? Hello, I'm Sophia Key, Head of Future Ready at WSP in the Middle East. In this episode of the Anticipate podcast, I am delighted to be joined by David Simons, Climate Change and Sustainability Director at WSP in the UK. In today's episode, we will discuss the significance of COP27 as a key event in the fight against climate change, as we globally convene to seek ways to accelerate climate action. We will try to anticipate its implications for our planet, region, industry, and how we can accelerate the adaptation of resiliency across global operations and supply chains. We will also look at the anticipated key outcomes that could be in store from the summit. David, welcome to the Anticipate podcast. Thank you, Sophia. Nice to be with you. David, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to hear about your perspective in the UK and Europe market and the amazing work you have been driving. As the previous COP was in the UK, maybe you could share your thoughts on how much impact Glasgow's COP26 achieved. How did it affect the engineering industry in the UK? And um, were there any missed opportunities that you observed in the industry? So I think from Glasgow last year, there's been good progress. I think also there's been some really substantial global challenges. And one of the biggest challenges that countries have as they come to COP27 is above all to maintain a focus on scale and urgency of climate change in spite of the recovery from the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the challenges that all of these are are, are presenting in terms of energy prices, cost of living crisis across the world. The biggest challenge in in, in our view is to, to really keep climate uppermost in government's minds when they just have so much other priorities on. And that will be the acid test really from COP26. There was a real significant amount amount of of progress made from phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, a commitment to phase down unabated coal programs to reduce emissions of methane by 30% by 2030, commitments on forestry and land use. All of that was really great. But the reality is, is that only 25 countries of the, what, round about 200 who said that at the end of COP26, they were asked to come back with beefed up climate plans. Only 25 countries have done that. And still, as we go into COP27, we are on track for a 2.8 degree temperature rise, which is a long way distant from the 1.5 degree target. That, that's quite startling. I wasn't aware of all of those statistics behind it. Um, and obviously, we've been globally challenged with so many other issues that, you know, it's fantastic to hear that we're still driving and pushing the agenda in the right in the right place and keeping that at the forefront of everyone's minds as we engage. I've observed this year more than ever. Globally, we've experienced unprecedented extreme weather events, the coupled with energy and fueling crisis which increases, which has affected many people. Is the 1.5 world commitment still alive? And what are the major achievements in the climate action domain since the Paris Agreement of 2015? And also kind of around major shifts in behaviour and awareness. Have you have you noticed many of these changes around climate action this year with this newfound awareness globally about our, our energy and prices, really? There is no doubt that I think in member states, and, and I think in most people across the world that the, the argument about is climate change an issue, that's resolved. There is, you know, we're, we're beyond those conversations now. The big challenge is still, can we, can we cut carbon? What are the ways that we can do that? And can we cut it on sufficient pace? As, as well as government leadership, I think I would give that there's two other pieces. There's been 
you know, some some bright spots around technology. If you just think about transport, transport was actually seen as one of the weak areas at COP26. I think that's a priority for us in uh, at COP27 to see um, beefed up commitments on, on transport. But the reality was that in 2021, half of the buses sold across the world were, were either battery electric or fuel cell. That's tremendous Fantastic. progress, isn't it? And so there is progress that is being made. I think your other point, Sophia, that you talk about is around climate resilience and adaptation, and that still is very much seen as the poor relationship um, and, and, and relation to, to to cutting greenhouse gas emissions. COP27 has to have more focus on that, and we are seeing that, and we will see, see more of that over the next few weeks in Egypt. Fantastic. I'm so excited to um, be involved in that process and and really giving that implementation focus from our WSP experience. I think that's so key when we're meeting with the global leaders, since we have so many projects on the ground and we want to do this right here, right now. Um, and addressing those challenges is something that we're all very passionate about. So it's an exciting time. Personally, seeing these shifts from uh, awareness around climate, awareness around user behaviour, I think it, it almost takes half the battle away from the the work that we do in the built environment and on a larger scale because you know people are people are understanding that it is very important and and that and that's great for our industry as well are any more climate commitments expected at, at 27 do you think other than the the ones that we've highlighted you know certainly we we would hope for more progress on things like transport and 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 the like, but but I think the adaptation piece is the area that Egypt, as the as the host, I think is particularly keen to to, to focus on. And there's two levels about this. First of all, developed countries promised in 2009 to provide around about $100 billion in public and private funding each year from 2020 to help poor nations respond and adapt to climate change. That has not been delivered in any year. Last year, uh, pledges were still about $20 billion short of the target. Wow. Um, so, so there is still a gap that needs to be closed. I think the other area that, that we will see and is on the agenda in, in Egypt is um, looking about a, a concept called loss and damage. And this is a concept which, instead of just thinking about that $100 billion to help poorer nations get ready for future weather, is also to provide a, a significant sum of money to developing countries to fund the nations that suffer losses due to hurricanes, rising seas and other impacts worsened by climate change. And because it's an African COP, the Africans are in charge and we will see this um, much more on the agenda than it was in Glasgow and previously. Absolutely. I think that the vulnerability of those communities are obviously why we do what we do, is that we are ensuring global parity in, in living conditions, in safety, security, access to energy, access to water, access to food supplies. So I think, you know, having it in Egypt and Africa is, um, is key to kind of catalyse the actions in this area. Let's move on now to climate finance, because it's perhaps one of the most important agenda items in COP27. Are there any prospects that the target uh, in 2009 that was set of 100 billion per year US dollars, um, do you feel that they will materialise in developing nations this year after COP27? Or are we still focusing on that recovery stage in terms of all of the, the other significant events that have happened within the past year? So, so I think if you look at the position that the European Union is taking in its negotiating stance, I think it is still talking about working towards meeting that. Uh, I think the much bigger conversation, I mean, that's really important, but but the bigger conversation is this whole conversation about loss and damage and just how substantial that should be when that might come in um, to force as well. Because you're right, Sophia, you know, finance is 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 a massive issue. It's a massive opportunity um, as well. And you can make all the pledges and the commitments in the world, but ultimately, if you can't fund those, if you it, that that's an enormous barrier to delivering both climate mitigation and also climate resilience at scale worldwide, so that we don't um, either have enormous economic shocks um, or we 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 affect the the most vulnerable in the world. 
Absolutely. And we're almost relying on an accelerated uptake of technology in order to benefit from mass production and uptake um, in the more uh, vulnerable areas. So um, one thing I have seen more recently is is global banks really singing about their sustainability um, pledges, the green funds, the grants. Um, so it's, you know, as we were speaking again, is this awareness globally means that sustainability and ESG is becoming quite a hot topic. And I think it's a very exciting time for us. Um, and I hope things do speed up quickly this year. To, to jump in on, on that, I mean, I think, you know, climate climate finance from the private sector is 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 critically important you know critically important to fund green industries but also to 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 have a plan to to stop funding the brown as well and the reality is is that that there's been a huge amount of conversation on this but the the reality is is that that there, there are still huge amounts of high carbon investments that are that are being funded, and um, and that locks in that locks in high carbon to to communities and to countries. So, David, we've just hit on a, a really interesting um, key word or a buzzword that we're hearing a lot of um, in the industries is carbon. Um, typically. Well, particularly here in the Middle East, carbon assessment within designs, decision making, stakeholder engagement hasn't particularly been at the top of the agenda. So the maturity is slightly behind, obviously, what what you've been working on in the UK and in Europe. So we'd really like to understand your perspective from experience um, in in carbon uh, and understanding carbon disclosure fully and, and kind of the direction we're going in terms of carbon penalties and incentives because this is real real you know important information that we we convey to our clients because we feel penalties are coming in terms of carbon um and true disclosure is 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 necessary in order to combat uh, climate change so I think it works at a number of levels, Sophia. I mean, I think, it, I mean, absolutely, there's a there's an important role for governments to have a clear plan about how they are getting to net zero. So, as you you know, you quite rightly talk about the the, the Middle East, UAE net zero 2050, for example, is a great ambition that I would suggest you know that, that that there needs to be a detailed implementation plan that, that 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 sits behind that and probably the same for Saudi Arabia as well it's Saudi has come a long long way its commitment to be net zero by 2060 is is, is possibly less ambitious than, than 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 other markets. You've got to have a government level plan that talks about how are we going to do that with governance and with accountability. Once you've got that, you've then got the framework to then say this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And finance and carbon in decision making becomes utterly fundamental. And doing carbon assessments in terms of if we build this project, what does that do to carbon in terms of direct carbon, but also the carbon emissions that it enables or the carbon emissions that it avoids are, are, are really important parts of decision making processes again, where you have that framework. So the UK um, ahead of COP26 beefed up the carbon price that is used in value for money assessments for government funded infrastructure projects. That has a big impact on the value for money and the business case for high carbon emission projects. It also makes programmes such as carbon capture storage much, much more attractive. And so you have your framework finance becomes really, really important. And then obviously also, as is having clear basis of data so that you're capturing that in a consistent way, it's freely available and people can make comprehensive, correct and transparent decisions based on that. That's fantastic. It's really good to hear your insights on, on, on you know, delivering uh, net zero. And 2050 here feels a very long time away. Um, as you say, by having an appropriate framework, milestones, targets to work towards. Um, you know, I, I often say to my kids, you can't eat an elephant all at once. You have to yes. kind of break it down um, so that you hit the interim targets. Um, and I think this is something very interesting that we will see here in the Middle East over the, the coming year, particularly when we have COP28 um, being delivered here in Dubai, uh, at Expo 2020. So um, it's, it's very exciting times here. There's a role model that countries might wish to follow as well that sort of 
New Zealand, the UK and others have an independent committee on climate change that, 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 that plots the trajectory that governments should deliver on, on the most cost effective path. So, so that gives the, the milestones that countries need to hit so that you're not high carbon up until 2049 and then dropping off a cliff in 2050. Yeah. <laughs> it also really brings it much, much forwards than 2050. In the UK, we're, we're, we're looking very, very hard at the moment at um, for, for infrastructure investments at, at, a, at a period called Carbon Budget 6, which runs between 2033 and 2037. And right now, that is driving a lot of strategic thinking in terms of what does that actually mean that we have to do for buildings, for transport, um, for, for energy generation? Is it all technical or can we can we meet carbon budget six um, just technology or do we need behaviour change as well? And these are really, really important Absolutely. decisions and they're happening well before 2050. If you wait until 2050, you know what? Some of these decisions are difficult and we're seeing that ahead of COP27. These are really difficult things. And frankly, Absolutely. some of these things, actually, it's easier to put off the decision if you can avoid it. The great thing about having interim targets and in the UK, and I think New Zealand's case, they are legally binding on governments, then that mm. forces the the, 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 the pace and it forces the decision making. But oh my goodness, Sophia, it's not easy. It's so challenging. There's so many moving parts and considerations and, you know, it's never never a clear cut decision in the, in the way that we work sometimes because where you have one thing, one criteria being hit, there's another mm. criteria that affects it. So it's a, it's, um, mm. it's definitely a challenge. Um, and I think having the the financial motivation and the behavioural mm. changes within within the decision making process and this whole awareness around um, carbon assessments is 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 key here. Um, and seeing that traction this year is 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 very invigorating in the industry. Sophia, I suppose the other area that I, I was when you talk about finance and 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 the like is particularly well the the the, the critical role of business. Mm. Um, and the opportunity that greenhouse gas leadership provides for, for top line growth for companies. And by setting a really ambitious science based target, um, by investing in um, tools that help our clients plan for, um, for, 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 for electric vehicle uptake, let them um, understand future climate risks on their networks and, and, and invest for it. This stuff sets us apart. It's what our clients are looking for. And it's a growth opportunity for us as much as it, of course, being a responsibility risk avoidance piece for us. And so I, I always think for climate that sometimes we think, and especially at COP27, that People will think it's it's government showing up. When government takes the leadership, then business will follow. I don't think we can do that now. That's no. why there's seven and a half thousand companies have committed to the UN Race to Zero program. It's why you've got a thousand and fifty-ish um, cities um, signed up to Race to Zero as well. WSP is one of those companies. We are doing it because absolutely it's the right thing for us to do. Our people expect us to do it. And also, it's a way that, that we set WSP apart and we grow our business. That's fantastic. I, I urge um, everyone listening to go and check out the uh, the Race to Zero uh, commitment and pledge. I think the, the more uptake we get, the, the better things will uh, accelerate and take off in the right direction. David, I'm just going to um, bring up a, another COP that's happening at a very similar time, but is kind of the lesser known little brother of COP27. Um, COP15 um, being hosted in Montreal in, in December with a focus around um, biodiversity. What are the overlaps between the two COPs and, and what will we see coming from COP15, do you think? So there's an enormous overlap between these and they, they are they are both United Nations global conventions. Um, and there is enormous overlap between climate resilience, climate mitigation and also biodiversity. Last year in Glasgow, we saw um, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use, with many, many countries committing to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. It's a great start, and of course, that will support biodiversity if it's well implemented. Um, the, the, the COP15 
um, the biodiversity COP in Montreal um, delayed from China um, because of because of of, of COVID. Um, we'll have a specific focus on on biodiversity and reversing biodiversity loss. Yeah, the the two completely go go hand in hand. And also, it's a timely reminder as well that that when we talk about sustainability, that's that 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 you have to think wider than just environment. And if you are thinking about environment, it's important to think just wider than than carbon as well. We are an interconnected n- network of, of 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 issues and opportunities, and really we 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 solve all of these issues from a systems perspective, not just by only focusing on greenhouse gas emissions. David, I think we will round off our conversation here. We've had we've brought up so many fan- fascinating points here, and we we're understanding the global implications of COP for our industries and sectors. As a conclusion from COP, how do you think we can best support our clients and stakeholders in demystifying the messages that come out of COP um, and translating that into tangible, deliverable projects, uh, communities and built environment and transport on every single level? Um, it, it's a big question, but I think it's it's one that we are very well placed to answer. And it goes to the heart of our future ready thinking Absolutely. as well, Sophia. So with, with future ready, we see the future more clearly and then we take that out of an interesting conversation and we challenge and inspire every person in WSP to advise and design to that future as well as for today. Virtually every country now has made a global net zero commitment, and and the vast majority of those are to be net zero, effectively fossil free by 2050. That is an enormous, probably one of the most important future trends that that we are anticipating, as also is the future weather extremes that we will see from from climate change that that, that is locked in. The opportunity for for us in WSP is to bring that future ready thinking and to be working with our clients um, and to be using the brilliance of of, of our people across the world to be designing infrastructure, buildings, projects, strategies that are ready for that net zero world, um, as well as meeting our clients needs today. And through that, we have an enormous impact. We make our clients look good. And it means Mm -hmm. that from WSP, we are bringing every one of us the best that we can to our work every day. Absolutely. Um, It's it's very motivating um, and it's very invigorating to hear all of the positivity that we are dissipating throughout the industry and through our people. Um, Thank you so much, David, for the insights that you've shared today with our listeners. To our audience, thank you for listening all the way through. Please leave a comment if today's episode has sparked your interest. And don't forget to join us in two weeks time for a new talk. And also, please follow WSP on our socials as we head over to Egypt for COP27 to accelerate meaningful change with our on the ground expertise. Thank you.